at the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic, we believed that it was transmitted by uh, touch and by droplets that you respired. Uh, we now know uh, the latest science says that it's uh, transmitted by aerosols, so little tiny droplets that stay in the air uh, that you breathe out and, can, and contain the virus. And I'm going to talk to one of the world's foremost authorities on aer aerosols, Dr. Kimber Kimberly Prather, who is the Distinguished Chair of Atmospheric Chemistry at the University of California in San Diego. So welcome to the uh, interview, Kimberly. Well, thank you. Thank you for having me. Okay, so uh, let's get right into it. What is the latest science on aerosol transmission of COVID-19? I mean, the latest science is kind of the same science we've been saying for a year, some of us have been saying for a year and a half, which is this virus is largely transmitted through the air. And the way you get infected is by breathing it in. Um, and it's transmitted in little tiny aerosols that we produce um, just simply by breathing, but you produce more when you speak and you produce even more when you yell. And so what has happened, a really sort of a, a way that this virus has sort of snuck its way around the globe is it it's released by people who don't know they're sick. So they're not coughing spray, they're not, you know, releasing massive droplets, which is what we used to think of, you know, how things, how we got infected. Um, it's coming out in these little aerosols that float like smoke. And if you're indoors with a lot of people and someone's infectious, these aerosols can build up in a room just like smoke. And so if, you know, the longer you're in that room, the greater the chance that you could become infected by inhaling infectious aerosols. So if I understand this correctly, the droplets are bigger and they, we used to think that they, they fell to the ground within six feet of mm -hmm. being uh, expired or respired. Mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. and uh, that's why we have the, the six feet, six foot uh, uh, distancing requirements. And that's not the case anymore. Now we understand that they build up in a room and the small, if you in a smaller room with poor ventilation, that's a big issue, right? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. So we like to say droplets drop. So you're right. And that's been, that was the focus, but aerosols float and in poorly ventilated spaces, um, you know, they can actually build up. And that is where, as I say, most of the infections can occur. Now, there's been a lot of debate around this, and we've seen public health authorities, at least in Canada, come out and say that, no, it's still droplets, and they, it's like they don't accept the science on, on aerosol transmission. Why do, you, do you have any opinions on why that might be? I, I honestly am perplexed. I, that's the nicest way I can put it, because you know all the science, every single paper publication that has come out, and they're just coming out a lot more coming out, shows the virus. Before they said, are you sure it's in the aerosols? Then they showed it was in the aerosols. Are you sure it's infectious? Then they showed it was infectious. I mean, every piece of evidence we have points to this virus being in aerosols. Um, there is not a single piece of evidence that shows that it's in droplets. And so, you know, I, it's, I've had people explain to me that it's just been, you know, changing a paradigm, right? It's in the medical community for a hundred years respiratory viruses, droplets, it's always been pointed to droplets. That's what's in the medical textbooks. And so one thing I've learned is it is a minor fraction. There are medical doctors, there are infectious disease experts that do agree it's aerosols now that have paid attention to the literature, but there is still a chunk and there's a number of them up in Canada who are still very focused on washing your hands and washing surfaces, which it's important, but you know, it's been shown, you know, CDC, our CDC, US CDC has said there's less than a one in 10,000 chance if you touch a contaminated surface that you will get infected. So I have no clue. It's very frustrating. I mean, Canada, you know, is just has been one of the, the holdouts, to be honest. And, you know, it's really hard to watch because, you know, I always say, and sometimes people will say, well, if you say it's airborne, people will get afraid. That is just an excuse. You know, we, ha we know what to do. If we acknowledge it's in the air, we can fix it. This pandemic would have been over a long time ago, and a lot less people would have been infected and died if people would have just acknowledged it is in the aerosols. Well, that's, uh, goodness gracious, if it was only that simple uh, to get people to change their minds. So yeah. now, that this, now that the science has said that the primary means of trans, uh, transmission is aerosols, uh, what can like public health authorities, school boards do? What can individuals do? Yeah, I mean, once you realize it's in the air and you, you can start to think about what are the riskiest places 
to kind of avoid or be careful and wait, how can you protect yourself? And so, you know, avoiding crowded indoor places where people aren't wearing masks, that's number one, avoid that, right? Um, but if you are indoors, you should wear a mask, a good mask, a good fitting mask, not a surgical mask, which leaks aerosols, um, but wear a good mask if you're indoors. Distance is still important. Um, ventilation, open the doors and windows, make sure your HVAC system is bringing in lots of fresh air. A lot of people, those are all free. Those are free fixes. And then what we do, what we've added to this is filtration. Just let's, you know, the best thing you can do is block it. Have the person who's potentially sick, have it blocked. Don't ever let it out in the air. That's number one in infection control is to block the source. But once it's released, then you have to do these extra steps. And we call it the Swiss cheese model, where each layer is a layer of protection. You stack, no one is perfect, you know, but when you stack them together, you get a really good solution. The final one is filtration. And what we've been doing is we've been building, you can either get HEPA filters, just a simple HEPA filter to just pull it back out of the air. And again, it's just, you know, they're, each thing sort of helps in its own way. We, there's also these small boxes. We're building them today here at UC San Diego. We're building 250 of them called the Corsi Rosenthal Cube. And, you know, they cost about $70 a piece cheap anyone can make them tape them together and they work incredibly well and so again i just that's what i refer to as the safety net we're putting them in all of our classrooms that have lots of students right and so we're just adding an extra an extra layer you know to tracing through testing and we also do um here we're doing sewer surveillance surveillance you know sewage surveillance we do a lot of different um angles and all of them help in their own way Dr. Prather, thank you very much for this. I uh, really appreciate your insights. And I, I hope that the uh, public health authorities and school boards and so on finally do begin to listen to the science. Yes, I do too. Thank you very much.